Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Mike Rothmiller, who is a New York Times bestselling author, historian, a former cop, and an army medic. He's a former TV reporter and award-winning documentary TV producer and television host. He's authored 23 books plus, and the book we'll be talking about today, published uh, earlier this year, is Bombshell, The Night Bobby Kennedy Killed Marilyn Monroe. Welcome to Geopolitics and Empire, Mr. Rothmiller. Pleasure to be here. Um, you know, y- your book is for me is uh, explosive. I mean, I touch a lot on the you know some of the themes, deep politics, and that sort of thing. But I haven't read something like this in a long time. I highly recommend uh, the book, and I am a bit you know uh, shaken. There's so much in there; we'll only be scratching the surface, and I don't even know where to begin. Uh, apparently, you also felt shaken. Uh, writing it to you you uh also having encountered all manner of mendacity and atrocity but um you say that you, you you've been shaken by your investigation into the death of Marilyn Monroe and let me just um read a quote uh, I think your co-author writes that uh, regarding y- you that you remain most concerned by this in- investigation into the death of Monroe the psychological and in some cases physical harm she suffered at the hands of those who were accepted as being good righteous honest and trustworthy amplified the unease you felt about this uh, abuse of power end quote so perhaps we can uh, start there yeah well as in many countries uh politicians when they reach a certain point whether it's the presidency here presidency in other countries um there are a lot of things that they undertake that are not legal And a lot of times they'll say, well, it's for the betterment of the government, for the greater good. But in many cases, it's not. In most cases, it's for their greater good. And what happened here is something that has happened many times around the world, is that uh, some powerful politicians got in a position from sex, and when it became known to them that their empire may be destroyed by this woman going public you have to silence the person and that's the way they look at it to preserve their political power so that's basically what happened uh in this situation and in many other situations through history yeah as you said it's i mean it happens in all uh countries in america in this sense is not any different or uh better and again i really enjoyed your book i find it very uh credible authoritative um you come from a very you know decorated background and and maybe and and you discuss at length uh who marilyn monroe was but you know briefly you know how would you sort of summarize uh marilyn monroe as as you saw her well she needed to have men in her life that's neither good or bad but she was very intelligent, which uh, a lot of the intelligence that I read when I was working in that field, uh, the wiretaps and so forth, demonstrated that she was intelligent. And she had a pretty decent understanding of geopolitics at that time. And uh, she also, for whatever reason, needed uh, perhaps a father figure in her life. And so she started uh, sexually using her body to get some of these powerful men close to her and to maintain that closeness. And that was either through marriage or just through affairs. And that was probably her downfall, without a doubt, was doing that. And uh, it's not saying that it was anything right or wrong. It just, it was what it was. And it ended up costing her her life. And that's what it comes down to. But uh, from reading her diary, because there's her diary, there's a copy of it in LAPD Intelligence when I worked there. And I read it and I took notes from it. And that's in the book, too, some of the notes. And um, so you look at that and you look at what happened and the cover up afterwards and who was involved. uh, It's a situation where, you know, you just say, I can't believe it happened, but yet it did. And uh, I'm positive that someday it will happen again. Who that may be, there's no doubt in my mind it will happen again.
the sky and I got this relief inside Then there's no need to hide I'm going all the way up ah, I'm going all the way up ah, I'm letting go in my heart ah, Of everything that holds me down No, no Also, if you need health insurance that covers you wherever you may roam, check out my friend James Guzman's Borderless Health Insurance. One of the great things about living internationally is saving money on health care, but private care overseas can be expensive. Go to borderlesshealthinsurance.com to watch a short presentation on expat and digital nomad health care and sign up for a free consultation to review your options. I'm sure things like this are just uh, ongoing as we speak and Maybe also to get your thoughts on the Kennedy brothers, JFK and RFK, um, you know, myself being a former professor of international relations, um, I've admired many of the political decisions uh, taken by uh, both Robert and Bobby. But again, that's kind of separate from some of the things that go on in, in, in your book and the decisions that they were making and, you know, quite. I was quite shocked because I haven't read this uh, anywhere except for for your book uh, in, in in depth. The the kind of you know when you talk about JFK, the affairs that he was having with people you mentioned in the book, like Judith, Judith Exner, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Um, I, I think there's a quote. I, I mean, he was publicly linked with Hollywood actresses and many other women, um, and so it's kind of I mean just shocking the level of of their I don't know what you'd call it their their sexual uh prowess and just uh your your thoughts on on both Robert and and, and Bobby um in this regard and and in any other uh regard well John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy they did a lot of great things but uh I've got letters going back to World War II when before Joe Kennedy their older brother was killed they were basically having a contest with women, him and JFK, how many women they can get in the bed. And they were naming them in the letter and so forth. And so you, you have to go back and look at their father. Their father was doing the same thing. And that's what they saw growing up. So that was, for a better term, normal to them. And so they just carry that on. Um, when JFK became president, you know, I thought, wonderful. You know, I was a young teenager. I thought, this is great. Uh, but then when I started working in intelligence, I started seeing things that he was really up to, even though he was dead then. Uh, I said, wait a minute, this isn't the guy that I knew. And this isn't the Robert Kennedy that I knew, or I thought I knew. And as one example, uh, Robert Kennedy approved the wiretaps on Martin Luther King. They wiretapped his house. They but they did other things, broke into his house, the FBI and so forth. And... <clears throat> JFK, you mentioned Judith Exner. He was having uh, an affair with this woman named Judith Exner. Well, Judith Exner was the girlfriend of Sam Giancana. Sam Giancana was the mafia don in Chicago at the time. And he's probably one of the most powerful mafia guys in the country. And so <clears throat> when you start looking at this and realizing what the FBI had on JFK, because uh, they got him on a wiretap. They had a wiretap on Sam Giancana's house. JFK, as president, called Judith at that house. And that was picked up on the FBI wiretap. And so uh, J, J. Edgar Hoover uh, got a hold of Robert and said, I want you to listen to this recording. And he listened to it and he heard his brother speaking to Judith. And he says, now, you, you must know that Judith Exner, when this phone call went through, is at Sam Giancana's house, and she's also having an affair with Sam Giancana. And so at that point, Hoover knew he was never going to be fired from the FBI, no matter what. Uh, but it still didn't stop John Kennedy from having further affairs. He just, okay, well, that's one down. Um, nothing's going to happen. And he just continued on. And that's partly to blame from the media at the time. The media was covering for most politicians, and especially for him. And then 
<clears throat> when he was introduced to Marilyn Monroe, he started having an affair with her. Uh, that came through Peter Lawford and so forth. And then when it was becoming politically dangerous for him to continue with Marilyn because she was getting quite upset uh, reading her diary and other intelligence reports. And so Robert had a chat with her. Then Robert started having an affair with her. And she mentions all this in her diary, uh, her affair with Robert Kennedy, JFK, what type of sex acts, Jack Light, and so forth. And um, it just continued until they both cut it off, their relationship with her. And that was really what sent her over the edge uh, as far as anger. She was a scorned woman at that time. She mentioned it in her uh, diary. She mentioned it on telephone calls afterwards uh, that I read the transcripts to, the wiretaps. And so it came down at the end. What do we do? If she goes public at that time, it would have ruined the presidency. He probably would have resigned. It would have ruined their entire political careers for both of them. But they decided to go about it in another fashion. And uh, that was, you look who had the power and who could eliminate who. And that's what it boiled down to. And who could cover it up. And that was LAPD. And I mentioned every way they covered that up within the book and who was involved. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a sad piece of history, but it is history. And I know it's true because I saw it. And uh, as you know, one of the people that I interrogated was Peter Lawford. And he told me everything they did that night, uh, him and Bobby at her house. And uh, another guy I spoke with quite a bit was Fred Otash. And Fred became an informant of mine when I was working in intelligence, but he's the man who planted the bugs and the wiretaps in Marilyn's house and in Peter Lawford's house. And so he had access to all the conversations that were going on in the house and over the telephone. And um, he told me everything that he was doing that he did. And plus he supplied the transcripts and audio tapes to LAPD intelligence. However, he was also supplying some of them to the CIA, to the FBI. And the one guy who wanted to get in there in the beginning was Jimmy Hoffa, because Hoffa hated the Kennedys. But uh, Fred told me that Hoffa was a hothead. So even though they paid him well, he would not give Hoffa anything that Hoffa would immediately run to the media with. Because what would happen, it would fall back on Fred then. Okay, where'd you get these wiretaps? Who did it? And so forth. And he would uh, take the fall for it. So it was an interesting situation. A lot of people were interested, very interested in what the Kennedys are doing that could be embarrassing or criminal. And uh, a lot of them were paying for it. CIA paid Fred, FBI paid Fred Otash. And the one who was paying him the least amount was LAPD intelligence. And the reason being, Fred used to be an LAPD cop prior to that. He was always operating in and around Los Angeles, Southern California. So he knew that if if he started trouble, put it that way, did quite, with LAP intelligence, they would destroy him. And I know how that could be done because I saw it done to some people. And so he was supplying LAPD intelligence with more information than he was supplying to the CIA, the FBI, and to Jimmy Hoffa. So when you bring all this information together and you start comparing it with other people um, and you read the intelligence reports, uh, it paints a rather disturbing picture of the government at that time. Something that went through my mind reading um, your book was, I mean, we're talking about, right, you know, 50s, 60s, and just comparing it to today, the social media, digital age, smartphones, internet, you know, you got AI cameras everywhere, CCTV surveillance. Uh, do you think something... Uh, like what had happened in the 60s, all of these, you know, Kennedys and, and Sinatra and Monroe, just everyone sleeping around, all of these shenanigans that I, I don't think that could have happened in, in this day, day and age. Do you think? I think it could. <laughs> I, I really do. It's just that people are more sophisticated now. If they're going to do something, they're more sophisticated. And what goes on now 
is just the same that has gone on for decades, if not centuries. And that is, if you get somebody in power who really has power, if you can get something on them, you can control them. Something that would ruin their political career or whatever. You can pretty much control them in a lot of areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then on the other hand, the people in power have, you want to say law enforcement, federal law enforcement, the intelligence agency working for them. And so they can go after them and cause them a lot of misery if they want to. Uh, so it's it's an interesting balance, but that balance was there years ago before technology changed. It was still there. And uh, it's going to continue. Um, power brings power and uh, people have power want more power. And so I don't doubt it will continue. Uh, I just think they'll be more sophisticated in the methods that are used. Yeah, fascinating. And uh, so uh, you, you mentioned Peter uh, Lawford, who was there uh, with Bobby the night that Bobby uh, took the life of Marilyn. You tracked down uh, Peter Lawford. You got a confession from him. And then apparently there was an attempt uh, on your life you survived as well as others like i believe it was detective franklin who stopped um peter and bobby and marilyn's i think psychiatrist uh, on the on the night so he was another witness who could confirm bobby's uh whereabouts and so if you want to just talk about the attempts um uh on your life and and uh others like uh, detective uh, franklin okay well i'll back give you a little more background on uh, peter lawford and about uh uh, spring of 82, 1982, I was working intelligence and I had access to the Playboy Mansion in LA, in Los Angeles. Anytime I wanted to go, I could get in uh, because working intelligence, we had access to a lot of things that people normally don't have access to. And so I took my wife and a friend and his girlfriend to the Playboy Mansion on a weekend. I said, you want to see it? Most people want to see it, right? They said, yeah, as we're going through it, there was a small room and I heard a television going in there and the guy who was giving the tour, the head of security was talking to the other people that I'm with. And I walked over that room and I looked in and I, there's this guy there had long hair watching TV. It was a very small room. Uh, and he was staring at the TV and I kept looking at him. He looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. And then he finally looked at me and I was, Oh, that's Peter Lawford. Boy, does he not look well. You know, it was just, he was getting along then in age, and uh, he just looked at me and nodded. And he went back to watching TV, and he was drunk or on drugs or a combination. And so I took one of my business cards, said I worked intelligence, my number, both, just shoved it in his pocket. My wife and them came in and said, oh, listen, Mr. Lawford, and he just nodded and went back to watching TV. And so... Roughly uh, a week or so later, I get a call at the office, and uh, it was Peter Lawford. And so I was speaking to him, and he didn't remember meeting me. And that just went to the point that I think he was loaded or drunk. And uh, he kept asking me, well, who are you? And I said, I'm with LAPD Intelligence. I want to talk to you about some things from the past in the movie industry. I, that was that was the excuse I used to get him to meet with me. and. He kept asking me, he says, well, wait a minute, are you with the CIA? And I said, no, not with the CIA. <clears throat> We'd talk a little more. He said, are you sure you're not with the CIA? No, I'm not with the CIA. So we set a time and a location, a public park. I went there. He arrived late. I didn't think he was going to show. And <clears throat> I walked up to him. He still, he, at that point, he looked at me. He didn't remember me, you know, and he wasn't drunk. No alcohol on his breath or anything. I, I don't think he's under the influence of any medication then. So we sat down on the bench. We started talking. And I was testing his memory uh, going back to the 50s and 60s and so forth about people he was around and things that I knew uh, from intelligence, reading his wire, the wiretaps on his houses. And he was accurate 99% uh, of the time. So I knew, okay, his memory's good regarding that time frame. So then I just asked him, uh, well, tell me what happened the night Marilyn died. 
simple question. And he was puzzled by it, but then he started into the same story that LAPD intelligence scripted for him way back when. And I stopped him. I said, Peter, that's BS. I know that. And I started giving him reasons why I knew it. Uh, I said, I read all the intelligence files. I read the wiretaps on your house. And then I told him, so one thing you didn't realize that even though he initially had this Fred Otash put a bug in his house, Fred, being the man that he was, one, one foot in the criminal world, one foot in legal, he was wiretapping him in. He said, hey, I'll put a wiretap on him. And so he didn't realize that until I told him. And I could see he started thinking, oh, my God, what did I say? And uh, so finally, he just gets up. He's going to walk away. And at that stage, I could see he was angry. But it went from a conversation like you and I are having to a hostile interrogation. And uh, I got up, got in his face, told him some things. And I told him, said, you know, I'm, I'm not here to arrest you. Nobody's going to prosecute you. Nobody's going to arrest you. Everybody's dead. I just want to know what happened. So you can tell me now or not. And somebody will find out that we've been talking. And they may think that you're telling me things you shouldn't be telling me. So <clears throat> he sat down again on the bench. And he just covered his face with his hands and uh, was leaning forward. And I sat down next to him. And he just said, what do you want to know? I just, just tell me what happened. And that's when he just started. He laid out the whole story, what him and Bobby did that day, that afternoon and that evening and afterwards. And um, who came to the house when he and Bobby were leaving? What happened inside the house between Marilyn and Bobby uh, that whole evening? The fight that went on, the physical fight, the screaming, yelling. And he was concerned because they were screaming so much that one of the neighbors may call the police. Um, so after Bobby retrieves a, a drink that he, he made for Marilyn, nobody knows what was in it. It was a glass of water. He saw Bobby stirring something into it. He gave it to Marilyn, and uh, Marilyn was sitting on a sofa in the living room, and she drank it down with his coaxing, and then they started looking through the house again for whatever they're looking for, diary, photos, anything related to Marilyn and the Kennedys. So at that stage, they come back out and he he looks at Marilyn. Uh, he says, a short time later, and she's just laying back on the sofa, her head back, and she looks ashen. And uh, he said, she looked like she was completely out of it. And I said, you think she was dead? He said, well, she kind of looked like she may have been dead. So he was concerned with that. And about that time, he goes over to her. He says, there's a knock on the door, the front door. And he goes, oh, my God, it's the police. They're here. And Robert just said, let's go. And he said, well, how about Marilyn? He says, let's go. And they just go out. And, and interesting, when somebody's knocking on your door, and you answer it. If you don't know who they are, you're going to go, who are you? What are you doing here? And but if you know somebody, you're going to say, well, come in or whatever. And he says, they opened the door and these two guys were standing there in plain clothes, not suits, plain clothes. And he said, they just stepped back and Robert said, let's go. Robert basically grabbed by the arm. They walked out to the car and he got in. He didn't say who they were. He didn't acknowledge them. They didn't acknowledge them. And he says, as they were getting to the car in that area, he says, these two guys walked in the house. They closed the door behind them. Then they left. He said. Robert would not tell him who those people were, but he says it was apparent to him he, he knew who they were, at least one of the guys. And as it turned out, when I was talking to um, Peter and from other intelligence that I read, the guy, one guy that was there was the captain, the commander of LAPD intelligence and a longtime friend of the Kennedys. And uh, he went in. And with the other guy, and they basically staged everything uh, to make it look like a suicide. In about 93, when my first book came out, I received a telephone call from a guy named Jack Clemens. I didn't know who he was. And he said, I want to talk to you about Marilyn Monroe's death. I said, okay, who are you? And he told me, he says, I was the first cop 
uniform cop. I got the call and to the house. And then he told me, which is all in the book, how he started spotting a cover up immediately and what was going on, the people that were there. And it was hours after Robert Kennedy and uh, Peter Lawford left the house and how it was staged. And he said, even the way Marilyn's body was staged. And uh, so that went on for a number of hours before he was relieved there and he left. And then uh, when he was at the police station, a few days later, these two guys come in and uh, they say, we have some photographs we want you to initial. He said, of what? In a, of Marilyn Monroe, dead. Well, that was something completely out of protocol for LAPD. You didn't initial photographs. The guy who took the photographs, the initials appear on the photographs. So he says they start handing him these black and white photographs. He's looking at them, Marilyn in bed and so forth, her body. And he says, well, I didn't take these. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my serial number on it and initial them. And the guy says, no, we want you to. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. He didn't know who these two guys were at that time. So he says he, he picks up two of the photos. They're eight by 10 blacks, black and whites. He's looking at them. And one you've probably seen on, on the internet. And it shows Marilyn in bed. And there's a, she's dead. And there's a telephone next to it. He says the next photo he picks up and looks at, it's Marilyn in bed, but she's holding the telephone receiver. And he said, obviously, it was all staged. And they were staging it at the time to see what photos they'll need down the line. And he said, he told me, he says, now, how does a dead person pick up a telephone? You know, good question, right? Doesn't happen. And uh, so he said, no, I'm not going to sign these. So the guy pulls out his ID. Who was it? Captain Hamilton from LAPD Intelligence, ordering him to sign it. So he said he knew at that time, even though he already saw what was going on in the house, that a major, major cover-up was underway. And it involved all the way up the chain of command, well, Hamilton, charge of intelligence, because he reported directly to the chief of police and the chief of police. And so that's where it started. It carried over to the district attorney's office because they were told nothing. But also the coroner was basically, if you want to say, uh, strong arm into saying certain things uh because that's all in the intelligence documents too so when you, you look at everything uh it was a major cover-up of a murder that occurred or a killing and um, even to this day you know what was the reason behind it never saw that in an intelligence report but talking to people from the time and other people i've met since then uh, it was to keep her quiet because she could have taken down the presidency. So horrible situation, horrible outcome, but it happened. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds us a bit of the 90s. I remember as a kid, the whole Bill Clinton and uh, Monica Lewinsky stuff. And and just your further thought, on because you mentioned, you know, we see this corruption within the LAPD, as you say, you talk about the OOCID, where you worked and, you know, US government intelligence agencies. And again, I believe these things happen across the board, across time and space with many different governments. And today we talk about, you know, deep politics or deep state, something that I often uh, talk about. I taught about this. And I think the term comes from the 90s, if I recall, from Turkey, where there had been a car crash and people were sort of shocked to discover it in that car crash there was a turkish military general politician and you know a mobster you know what what were they the three of them doing together and then you you get this idea of how they all work together for different interests at different times and i mean do, do you have any further thoughts in general of this idea of uh, deep politics or or the the deep state given uh, your background and then your research and your writing Oh, yes, I saw the deep state at work, put it that way. Um, give, I'll give you a real quick example. In the late 70s and early 80s, um, we were concerned in L.A. that the 84 Olympics were going to be hit by some terrorists because we already had that intelligence. So I went to Mexico City and met with Arturo Durazo, commanding general of the federales, El Negro, uh, probably the most corrupt federal rally commander in history in Mexico. Well, 
when I went down there in, it was roughly about 1980, first time, Arturo was under a secret federal indictment out of Florida. He was a major cocaine trafficker. And so I've got all the documents since then, and it lays it out, but he would travel to the U.S. Now, what happened was, at the same time, uh, a lot of people remember the Contra situation in Nicaragua. Well, Arturo was the middleman between the CIA and the Contras running guns. He set up airstrips throughout Mexico where the planes would land, refuel, fly, deliver their weapons, and coming back, they would bring back his agricultural products, right, into the U.S. And how do I know this? I know this because I read the intelligence report, and Durazo told me. I was sitting there because when we met with him in Mexico City, he uh, he says, he just starts talking about stuff, and he says, well, you guys are CIA. Once again, CIA came on. Said, no, we're not CIA. He says, no, I know you're CIA. No, we're not. So anyway, he says, well, okay, you call yourself what you want, but I know you're CIA. And he says, and because of that, you know what I do for the CIA. And it was, okay, what do you do? And that's when he laid out this whole thing. How, yeah, he was indicted in Florida, but they removed, the United States uh, removed that warrant for his arrest out of what's called the lookout system. And that was, if you fly into any airport or port of entry, uh, you come to the States, you give them a passport or wherever, and they they run you through that. And if you have a warrant, they arrest you immediately. Well, that was removed from the system by the CIA and the Department of Justice. So Durazo would come and go as he wanted to the U.S. And then in about, uh, uh, would have been probably about 83, when he was out of office, he moved to La Jolla, California. And to Marina Del, California, Marina Del Rey, and he also had a house in Canada. Now I knew this, and I'd been out of that business for a while. And he also, uh, at that time, was plotting to kill the president of Mexico, the new president of Mexico, put together a mercenary force to go down. Because he thought if he killed the new president who was going after him for corruption, all that would end. And so he contacted. And I've got all these documents on seriously. He contacted the president of the United States and told him, said, listen, this Durazo guy is a major cocaine trafficker. They said, the, the uh, Department of Justice in Mexico said, Durazo left with about a billion dollars. They know that he had from smuggling and narcotic trafficking, shakedowns and everything else. And he's putting together a mercenary force to come down and assassinate me. And the president of Mexico, thought he could do it because he had such great contacts. So the president of the U.S. said, okay, we'll see if we can find him and let you know. Well, mysteriously, at that time, I was a TV reporter, and the federal government, the CIA, the FBI, they couldn't find Durazo anywhere in the world. I was in San Diego. He was living in La Jolla in San Diego, and I knew it. You know, I could find him. <laughs> and so anyway, as time went on, um, they finally caught him flying in his jet into Puerto Rico. And what the deal was, he was going to fly in, and that gave him access into the U.S. again, where he was just going to live out his time. And the people at the airport of Puerto Rico waiting for him to arrive was his wife, his son, and my old partner from OCID. Now, how did that happen, right? And uh, so Durazo was arrested, but not on the American warrant for drug trafficking. He was arrested on a warrant out of Mexico for all sorts of crimes. And he was sent to Los Angeles. And he ended one in extradition hearing. And he was finally sent back to Mexico where he lived out his life. And uh, but what was interesting is that the U.S. warrant was never served on him, even though he's in U.S. custody. And that's the cut. It always happens. So as time went by, maybe about five years ago, I, I started contacting the FBI. I said, I want to see why this warrant was never served on him. And at first, I 
filed a Freedom of Information Act, and the FBI lied to me. They said, we, we have no idea who he is. Who is he? And I said, so I wrote back, well, don't give me that, because you know who he was? He was meeting with the FBI director to come to the U.S. I was meeting with him. I discussed that with the FBI agents in West L.A., so forth. So don't tell me you don't know who he is. And plus, he had a warrant out for his arrest, which you guys don't bury. Um, maybe six, eight, nine months go by. And here's a guy they don't know anything about. They send me a CD-ROM of about 700 top secret documents on, all about him uh, with his drug trafficking and about attempting to assassinate the president of Mexico and how they couldn't find him. But within those documents and the other documents I obtained, it talked about how the CIA went to the FBI when he had this warrant out for his arrest, when he's still the commanding general of the federalities. They went to the FBI. They said, we got to pull this warrant, we got to bury it. So it's the FBI, uh, the CIA, DEA, and the State Department. I've got all the documents on it, how they all conspired. They got together and said, yes, let's remove that warrant and hide it because he's the middleman for the CIA supplying the contrast. And so that gets in the recent, relatively recent history. And so you look at that and you say, okay, uh, they did that. Uh, in the early 80s, and they covered for him for all those years. And what's interesting is that you'll appreciate this, is that I asked the Department of Justice for a copy of his arrest warrant. And they said, we don't know anything about that. What are you talking about? Even though I have to have, right? So I, I had a contact in Mexico City. I contacted that person. A week later, I had a copy of his arrest warrant from the secret indictment. And so I had that warrant, and I I sent it to the Justice Department. The cops said, you may need a copy of this someday. <laughs> so it's a matter of still they were covering this up as recently as four or five years ago. Because why it was embarrassing. And there's obviously some criminal aspects involved uh, that the government was involved in. So getting back, I know it's a long story, big circle, but uh, are they capable, the government, this ours and anybody else of doing the same sort of thing today? Certainly. Would they do it again today? Without question, if it serves their purpose and mainly serving the purpose is keeping a politician in power. You know, so has the world changed? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that that would be a great new uh, book for you to write about. And I mean, there's so much there. I remember when I was teaching at the University of Mexico, Tec de Monterrey, uh, I Skyped him Jefferson Morley, the author. He declassified the documents of how um, at least three Mexican mm -hmm. presidents were CIA agents. They had code names Lee Tempo. So, I mean, you've got what you're talking about, the yeah. head of the Federales. You had Mexican uh, presidents as CIA <laughs> agents. I mean, just uh, it's just fascinating um, stuff. And ha have you, uh, ha you know, your book, I think, was published, well, just a couple months ago or earlier this year. Uh, have you had any, co any contact with... Um, yeah, I'm I'm a fan of as I said, politically speaking, you know, Robert Kennedy, uh John F. Kennedy, as well as the son of Robert Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I like the work that he's been doing. He's a lawyer. And um, but nonetheless, ha ha have you had any contact with the Kennedy family uh, regarding um your book and thesis and you know, any response from them? Um, I've had no response, no contact since the book came out. Prior to the book coming out, um I received a call from a guy who was shot when Robert Kennedy was assassinated, who was staying, who was shot. He called me. And the reason being is that I think it was the Washington Post wrote an article about the RFK assassination, the questions that remained and, and how LAPD screwed up in areas. And so I was named to that because when a little bit of background would be very useful, when there was a major crime like a murder or death in southern california that involved a politician entertainer mob guy whatever lapd intelligence did their own investigation an intelligence investigation now the homicide team for instance on uh just say rfk okay the homicide guys they did the homicide investigation the intelligence guys did the intelligence investigation they used other tactics that people aren't aware of, yet the intelligence was never shared with the homicide guys. 
homicide guys generally never knew what's going on. And there are a number of cases like that. The Black Dahlia murder, uh, Bugsy Siegel, the mob guys he's killed, RFK, Maryland. They all had intelligence investigations conducted regarding their death. So within the uh, LRT file, I read the RFK assassination, intelligence assassination investigation. It did not jive with the public investigation that was out there. So <clears throat> way back when in 93 or so, um, I was contacted by an attorney that they were trying to reopen the case. And so I wrote a, a sworn deposition, went to the a, a secret LA County grand jury that in the, the documents on the RFK assassination tells the document, it talks about how 10 bullets were recovered from the people that were shot and from the location. Now, that's important because Sirhan Sirhan, the convicted assassin, had a revolver and only held eight bullets. He never reloaded, never had time to reload. So how do you account for 10 bullets? There had to be somebody else there. So anyway, that was written in the Washington Post article. This one fellow calls me, and then about um, maybe a week, two weeks later, I get a call from Robert Kennedy Jr. asking me what really happened. You know, We know what the official story is, but what really happened that intelligence-wise we knew, and we learned uh, there's a lot about that. And matter of fact, that will be in part of my next book. Um, and I have spoken to uh, Sirhan Sirhan, the convicted assassin, to his brother numerous times about it. His brother's got a lot of questions. His brother told me a lot of things that have never come out. And so when you look at it, um, LAPD intelligence knew that the official story was not accurate. It wasn't true. As they knew the official story with the Black Dahlia wasn't true, and as they knew uh, the true story with Maryland wasn't true, LAP intelligence knew all that, yet it has never come out and it never will. Uh, so I haven't spoken to any of the Kennedy family's members regarding this book, but prior to the book coming out, I did receive call from RFK Jr. regarding his father's assassination. Yeah, j just on that note, I mean, uh, recently, again, Jefferson Marley, who uh, interviewed just a couple months ago regarding his latest book, he just held a, held a press conference uh, regarding uh, more JFK files that were released, I guess, appar apparently showing Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a uh, CIA um, operation, right. and Robert Kennedy Jr. just tweeted, uh, because Tucker Carlson covered this, and Robert Kennedy Jr. just tweeted that the CIA's murder of my uncle was a successful coup d'etat from which our democracy has never uh, recovered. And I do view that, you know, RFK, JFK were taken out by, as we mentioned earlier, these deep state forces and including Martin Luther King Jr. Because when I was teaching for, uh, you know, U U.S. politics in Mexico, I was shocked to discover no, no one tells us about this. But in 1999, Coretta Scott King, Martin Luther King's wife and the whole King family, initiated a court case they didn't believe you know that the lone gunman that killed mlk and the verdict of that thousand page you know um there's a thousand pages transcript people can see that says local uh state and federal u.s government agencies participated in the conspiracy to assassinate mlk and so just um you know any of your further thoughts on on the, those three uh jfk um rfk and mlk yeah well probably uh now it goes back maybe 10 years ago i, I received some documents from CIA, and it clearly lays out that Lee Harvey Oswald, the assassin, the Q assassin of JFK, was a CIA asset. Uh, when he was in Russia, supposedly defected, he was supplying the CIA for information. And when he returned from Russia, the FBI, and I've got those done, the FBI wanted to recruit him as a spy for them. And so was there a connection? Absolutely. And that's starting to come out uh, now publicly. But then the question remains is that, yeah, I know uh, morally that they filed suit, was about to maybe a month ago to get the rest of the documents released that were supposed to be released. And now they released a few more, a handful, 
recently, a couple of weeks ago, but they're still holding back on how many documents. You know, you don't know how many they're holding. They may say we're holding three thousand. Well, they may have fifty thousand. Who knows? Um, so there's a reason for that because somebody's going to look very bad uh, in it, and I think you're going to see a conspiracy going in a lot of different directions. Um, and I know the documents I read, there's certainly after what, well, put it this way, regarding Jack Ruby, the guy who killed Oswald, there's a lot of stuff that's never come out about him and his connection with the mob and intelligence services and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot there. There's a lot that remains buried. And even the Warren Commission, which you're well aware of that, their investigation says at the end of it, well, we yeah, it was a conspiracy, but it wasn't the CIA, it wasn't the FBI, it wasn't this, it wasn't the mob, it wasn't the Russians, it wasn't the Cubans. Okay, well, after Dillos, who was it then? Uh, but that was their alibi because they knew other doctors would be withheld. And if they ever came forward, which all those people are dead now anyway, um, they wouldn't be accused of uh, covering something up. Yeah, and uh, to bring it then back to Marilyn Monroe, just a uh, question that you, you touch on it in the book as well. I think it's relevant. Uh, the media, I mean, we talked about the government, the deep state, but the media factor as well. I mean, just for fun, I went to Wikipedia. I don't trust Wikipedia, but it says, you know, uh, it conveniently, conveniently tells us that, you know, Marilyn Monroe's death was a suicide, nothing else to see here, no foul play, move along. Um, and the official narrative dissuades us from uh, conspiracy theory, right, uh, quote. And uh, I mean, you, you mentioned in your book as well, uh, I'll just read a quote, uh, during uh, 1990s investigations, you talk about Hirsch, who talked to columnists and wire service reporters who had worked in Washington and Hollywood during the 50s, they readily admitted uh, more than 40 years later that they couldn't get stories about the jfk maryland relationship published it was all behind closed doors Door doors kept very firmly shut uh with the help of you know chief parker lapd and just this grip that powerful forces have on the media i mean back then and even today um if something doesn't want to get out it, it it doesn't get out just your thoughts on uh, the grip that the power has on uh on media today oh um it, it certainly has a grip on it but to a point now, the media is more in line with the government, our current government, as far as keeping things quiet. When I was working intelligence, um, we were maintaining intelligence files on all the major TV reporters, you can imagine, uh, newspaper reporters. Uh, more importantly, though, we gathered intelligence on them, but who we really went after, especially within OCID went after, were the editors-in-chief and the publishers like a TV station that had news or something, they would go after the general manager of the TV station or the exec producer of all the news there because if they got something on them, when a story was going to come up, a lot of times they would get warnings ahead of time from that news media to say, okay, they're working, we're working on a story regarding X, Y, and Z, so prepare yourself. Or if it was really bad, they would LAPD intelligence would tell them, kill the story. And it was done many times. And I saw it. I saw investigations of murders. Uh, one in particular was a cop murdered this guy and he had to be a friend of the chief of police. And instantly, the investigation was dropped. Well, we don't know who did it. Stop investigating. And the homicide guys knew who did it. And so and there's cover-ups like that. And uh, it's a little more difficult today to do it. Because there are a lot of media outlets like what you're doing, uh, where 15, 20 years ago, there was no internet, you know, basically, and no podcast. And so there was no way of getting the information out. And if the government could control people in the media, that story remained dead. I mean, it was buried. And it would never come out. But fortunately, now, um, there are other means of getting the information out. It's just a matter of the main media, mainstream media, they are still the the big powerful ones within our country. And if the government wants something shut down from them, depends on what they have, they'll probably do it. You know, they'll keep it quiet. And then you just saw everything's coming out now about uh, what Elon Musk has been, it was like Twitter and some of the other ones. 
uh, you start saying, well, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, why is the government getting involved in this? Well, they want to keep a cap on things. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I still feel kind of proud that I'm just one little old, you know, little um, American with this little broadcast. And um, I guess I feel uh, I'm important enough that back in April, the Department of Homeland Security told PayPal to I, I'm banned from PayPal because the DHS kind of d- deemed me enough of an information threat that shut this guy <laughs> down. So I, I guess I'm having a pretty decent uh, impact. And um any then uh, final thought for us on you know uh, on your, your your book on uh, on Marilyn or you know a, a, anything else? Well, if the, if people want to know what really happened to her, get the book. It's detailed very well, and then um, it just came out two months ago, and the paperback will be out next month on Frank Sinatra and his mob ties through his entire life. Uh, Frank Sinatra and there's some mafia murders that happened because of him. So they want to see about Marilyn's death. And what Frank Sinatra was really doing with the mob, the two books out there now. Yeah, I, we didn't have to get, we didn't have time. I was going to ask you about Sinatra. I mean, in, in this book, you mentioned him, and he's uh, you know per, a bit of a, a loose cannon. And I'll have to get you back on uh, after I read your book on Frank Sinatra to talk about him. Is there any um, you know best way to find you uh, online or just basically look for your books? Just uh, Amazon's probably the best. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, go for the books there. All right. Uh, again, I uh, w- we just scratched the surface of what's uh, in this book uh, on Marilyn on Monroe. Let me just find the title again: "Bombshell: The Night Bobby Kennedy Killed Marilyn Monroe." The book, uh, the link will be in the description. Again, I highly recommend the book. Thank you uh, very much for being with us on Geopolitics and Empire, Mike. You're welcome. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up to the free email list that notifies you of every new podcast and other important updates. The email list and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's almost impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently strikes videos. Facebook restricts our page. Reddit, Twitter, and LinkedIn take down posts. After the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, or the Atlantic Council, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our pro account at one point. In April of 2022, the Department of Homeland Security had PayPal ban us for life. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the entire podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can support this guerrilla signal by donating via Donor box, buy me a coffee, subscribe star, or crypto. You can purchase a consultation with the host to talk about expatriation, geopolitics, or podcasting. You can also become a monthly or annual member via Stripe and receive benefits such as partaking in a monthly member Zoom call, get access to a weekly recording of my random thoughts, and a private Telegram channel. Thank you for listening.